Well, good morning, all. It's good to be here with you on Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know. I, uh, I'd like the Broncos to win, but I think it's probably going to be Carolina. What do you think? So um, i like to speak this morning um, and ask a question. Is your definition of God expanding? Now, anybody that knows me knows that I am not a dogmatist. I have far more questions than I have answers. In fact, I don't know about you, but it seems like the older I get, the less I know. But I'm hoping that maybe I can raise some questions and, uh, you know, rather than being up here in the pulpit, I, I just as soon have a cup of coffee with each one of you and talk about these things. But I'm hoping that as we raise these questions, maybe you'll talk to each other on the way home or uh, with your friends, with your family. Um, I'd like you to think about what it must have been like to live 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. I mean, it was only in 1543 that Nicholas Copernicus came up with his model for um, a heliocentric solar system that we revolved around the sun. Before that time, it was geocentric. That was the model going back to about the second century AD, just 500 years ago. Think about two or three or 4,000 years ago. You know, people didn't know where the sun went at night. They really didn't. It, it didn't mean they were stupid, but how could they know? We've found out so much just in our own lifetimes. I'd like to look at the, uh, the macro out there through the telescope and the micro, what you would see under a microscope. You know, with the, with the macro, and I think it was, um, wasn't there a ladies, um, meeting or something where somebody came and showed slides of the Hubble? Yeah, okay. Um, just in our lifetime, they, they took the Hubble telescope and we had the, the sky all charted out and they pointed it at a place in the uh, sky that they thought was empty. And it wasn't empty. They found layers upon layers, not of stars, galaxies. It seems like the more we learn, the more our mind is blown about how big our creator is. Look at the micro through the microscope. Uh, this past weekend, I wasn't here. I was down the shore where my, where my father lived, and I buried him in Little Egg Harbor. He loved it there. And... Uh, I was fine when we were cleaning out the house, but Robin kind of lost it. But I was very stoic. I was not feeling anything. But when I dumped his ashes in the harbor there, it just shot through me. Not, it was happy memories. It was my memories with him, but it was so final. Well, in the microscope, and you can Google this, different kinds of tears look different ways, just like different kinds of snowflakes. And it depends on the emotions that we're feeling. And um, they found that in these tears are different stress hormones that you're releasing. And, and uh, in medicine, we're just finding out more and more. So whether we look <laughs> out there or we look in, our minds are blown about this creator and who this creator is. Well, theologians um, have a model that they call progressive revelation 
what that means is when you look in the Bible, you see that God did not um, reveal everything about himself all at once. And I'd look, like to look at like four or five passages of scripture real quickly this morning just to show you how that uh, model works. So uh, let's start in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Uh, in verse 7, uh, I'll just read it. Um, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. <coughs> then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, if that was the only Bible passage that we had to go by, what would you think about God? He's anthropomorphic, right? He's walking in the garden. It's in the cool of the day, the time when people rested. Well, that's not where it ends. Uh, let's move for forward in time a little bit more. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, you have a, an account of the Philistines capturing the Ark of God. Well, the Ark was a, uh, a wooden, uh, uh, like a container or something, that the presence of the Lord manifested himself in and they carried this ark through the desert in a tent and God dwelled in a tent so the Israelites are fighting these battles and they were losing battles and they thought well how are we going to resolve this I know what we'll do we'll carry the ark of God into battle with us and that way we'll have God with us makes sense well guess what it didn't work they were defeated, and the Ark of God was captured by the Philistines. Well, that's a little bit more revelation. You can't put God in your hip pocket and carry him into battle with you and think you're going to win. Well, let's push it forward in time a little bit more. David wants to build a permanent house for God, and God says, No, I'm not going to let you do that, but your son's going to do it. And Solomon builds this elaborate temple in which God can dwell. And is in 1 Kings chapter 8, I want you to notice what Solomon says because it's further revelation about God. Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel. He spread out his hands towards heaven and said, O oh Lord God, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love and your servants who continue heart, whole, wholeheartedly in your way. You've kept your promise to your servant David, my father. Your mouth is promised, and with your hand you fulfilled it as it is this day. And check this out. Now, Lord, the God of Israel... Keep for your servant, David, my father, the promises you made to him. And on to verse 26. Or 27. This is the key point I want to emphasize. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built. Yet, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer of your servant that, you're, that is, he's praying this day. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night in the place where it said, my name shall be there. So that you hear the prayer of your servant and forgive the sins of your people. So here Solomon's saying, here I am, I'm building this house for you. And really, you know you're not. The heavens itself can't contain you. 
how much less this house that I built for you. Well, let's push it even further. Let's look in the New Testament at Paul on Mars Hill, Acts chapter 17. And he's giving his sermon to people who had an altar to an unknown God. And he said, this is the God that I want to tell you about. In verse 24, he says, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him, though God is not far from each one of us. For in God, we live and move and have our being. God is the ocean that we're swimming in. God animates every single molecule, whether it's under the microscope or it's out in outer space. God is not far from each one of us. In God, we live and move and have our being. Okay, one final passage, Colossians chapter 1. We're going to push this concept of God out even further. Chapter 1, starting in verse 15, it's talking about Christ. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, if there's an unseen world out there that we don't know anything about, spiritual entities, things that we can't see under the microscope, things that we can't see out in outer space. He created all of it. He is before all things, verse 17, and in him all things hold together, every single molecule. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself would come to have first place in everything. Check this out. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And through him, check this out, to reconcile all things. To himself. It's a pretty big all. You know, we just sang, there's a wideness to God's mercy. Maybe it's wider than we can even imagine. Maybe when it says that God will reconcile all things to himself, it might really mean all. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And then Colossians goes on with something that is even more mind-blowing to me. Because we're looking out there. Rulers, principalities, dominions, powers, things in the heavenlies. He's reconciling all things to himself. But here we are, dwelling on a little speck of dust in the corner of the universe. Who are we anyway? We're like under the microscope. But it goes on in Colossians to say, this is the mystery 
which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been manifested, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the one who made everything, the one who every atom, every molecule is animated by, dwells in you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for these scriptures that guide us to expand our mind about how great you are, how big you are, and yet you are in and through us. You are the ocean that we're swimming in, and God is not far from each one of us. We thank you and you pray, we praise you. Amen.